W.E.B. Du Bois, the talented tenth. The Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. The problem of education, then, among Negroes, must first of all deal with the talented tenth. It is the problem of developing the best of this race that they may guide the mass away from the contamination and death of the worst in their own and other races. Now, the training of men is a difficult and intricate task. Its technique is a matter for educational experts, but its object is for the vision of seers. If we make money the object of man training, we shall develop money makers, but not necessarily men. If we make technical skill the object of education, we may possess artisans, but not in nature men. Men we shall have only as we make manhood the object of the work of the schools, intelligence, broad sympathy, knowledge of the world that was and is, and of relation of men to it. This is the curriculum of that higher education which must underlie true life. On this foundation, we may build bread winning, skill, hand, and quickness of brain with never a fear lest the child and man mistake the means of living for the object of life. If this be true, and who can deny it, three tasks lay before me. First, to show from the past that the talented tenth as they have risen among American Negroes have been worthy of leadership. Secondly, to show how these men may be educated and developed. And thirdly, to show their relation to the Negro problem. You misjudge us because you do not know us. From the very first, it has been the educated and intelligent of the Negro people that have led the, and elevated the mass. And the sole obstacles that nullified and retarded their efforts were slavery and race prejudice. For what is slavery but the legalized survival of the unfit and the nullification of the work of natural internal leadership? Le Negro leadership therefore sought from the first to rid the race of this awful incubus that it may make way for natural selection and the survival of the fittest. In colonial days came Phyllis Wheatley and Paul Cuffey surviving against the bars of prejudice. And Benjamin Banneker, the Albanac maker, voiced their longings when he said to Thomas Jefferson, I freely and cheerfully acknowledge that I am of the African race and in color which is natural to them, of the deepest dye. And it is under a sense of the most profound gratitude to the supreme ruler of the universe that I now confess to you that I am not under that state of tyrannical thraldom and inhuman captivity to which too many of my brethren are doomed, but that I have abundantly tasted the fruition of those blessings which proceed from that free and un equaled liberty with which you are favored and which I hope you will willingly allow. You have mercifully received from the immediate hand of that being from whom proceedeth every good and perfect gift. Suffer me to recall you to mind that time in which the arms of the British crown were exerted with every powerful effort in order to reduce you to a state of servitude. Look back, I entreat you, on the variety of dangers to which you were exposed. Reflect on that period in which every human aid appeared unavailable and in which every even hope and fortitude wore the aspect of inability to the conflict. And you cannot but lead to the serious and grateful sense to your miraculous and providential preservation. You cannot but acknowledge that the present and freedom and tranquility which you enjoy, you have mercifully received that and that a peculiar blessing of heaven. This, sir, was a time when you clearly saw into the injustice of the state of slavery and in which you had just apprehensions of the horrors, horrors of its condition. It was then that your abhorrence, therefore, so excited that you publicly held forth this true and invaluable doctrine, which is worth to be recorded and remembered in all succeeding ages. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, 
that they are endowed with certain inalienable rights and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Then came Dr. James Durham, who could tell even the learned Dr. Rush something of medicine, and Lemuel Hayes, to whom Middlebury College gave an honorary AM in 1804. These and others we may call the revolutionary group of distinguished Negroes. They were persons of marked ability, leaders of a talented tent, standing conspicuously among the best of their time. And so we come to the present, a day of cowardice and vacillation, of strident, wide voice wrong and faint hearted prompt compromise. The double faced dallying with truth and right. Who are today guiding the work of the Negro people? The exceptions, of course. And yet so sure as this talented tent is pointed out, the blind worshippers of the average cry out in alarm. These are exceptions. Look here at death, disease, and crime. These are the happy rule. Of course they are the rule because a silly nation made them the rule. Because for three long centuries, this people lynched Negroes who dared to be brave, raped the black women who dared to be virtuous, crushed dark-hued youth who dared to be invit ambitious and encouraged and made to flourish severely in lewdness and apathy. But nor even this was able to crush all manhood and chastity and aspiration from black folk. A saving remnant continually survives and persists, continually expires, continually show itself in thrift and ability and character. Exceptional it is to be sure, but this is its chiefest promise. It shows the capability of Negro blood, the promise of black men. Do Americans ever stop to reflect that there are in this land a million men of Negro blood, well-educated owners of homes against the honor of whose womanhood no breath was ever raised, whose men occupy position of trust and usefulness, and who, judged by any standard, have reached a full measure of the best type of modern European culture. It is fair, it is decent, it is Christian to ignore these facts of the Negro problem, to belittle such aspiration, to nullify such leadership and seek to crush these people back into the mass out of which by toll and travail they and their fathers have raised themselves? Can the masses of the Negro people be in any possible way more quickly raised than by the effort and example of this aristocracy of talent and character? Was there ever a nation on God's fair earth civilized from the bottom upward? Never it is, ever was, and ever will be from the top downward that culture filters. The talented tent rises and pulls all that are worth the saving up to their vantage ground. This is the history of human progress, and the two historic mistakes which have hindered that progress were the thinking first that no one could ever rise save the few already risen. Or second, that it would be better the uprisen to pull the risen down. How then shall the leaders of a struggling people be trained and the hands of the risen few strengthened? There can be but one answer. The best and most capable of their youth must be schooled in the colleges and universities of the land. We will not quarrel as to just what the University of the Negro should teach or how it should teach it. I willingly admit that each soul and each race soul needs its own peculiar curriculum. But this is true. A university is a human invention for the transmission of knowledge and culture from generation to generation through the training of quick minds and pure hearts. And for this work, no other human intervention will suffice, not even trade and industrial schools. All men cannot go to college, but some men must. Every isolated group or nation must have its yeast, must have for the talented few centers of training where men are not so mystified and befuddled by the hard and necessary toll of earning a living as to have no aims higher than their bellies and no God greater than gold. This is true training and thus in the beginning were the favorite sons of, of the freedmen trained. 
Out of the colleges of the north came, after the blood of war, Ware, Cravath, Chase, Andrews, Bombstead, and Spence to build the foundations of knowledge and civilization in the black south. Where are they to have begun to build? At the bottom? Of course, quibbles the mole with his eyes in the earth. I, truly at the bottom, at the very bottom, at the bottom of knowledge, down in the very depths of knowledge, there were the roots of justice striking to the lowest toll, soil of truth. And so they did begin. They founded colleges and up from the colleges shot normal schools and out from normal schools went teachers and around the normal teachers clustered other teachers to teach the in the public schools. The college trained in Greek and Latin and mathematics, 2,000 men, and these men trained full 500,000 others in morals and manners, and they in turn taught thrift and alphabet to 9 millions of men who to today hold $300 million of property. It was a miracle. The most wonderful peace battle of the 19th century, and yet today men smile at it and in fine superiority tell us that it was all a strange mistake, that a proper way to found a system of education is first to gather the children and buy them spelling books and hoes. Afterward, men may look about for teachers, if haply they may have found them, or again they would teach men work. But as for life, why? What has work to do with life? They ask vacantly. Was the work of these college founders successful? Did it stand the test of time? Did college graduates with all their fine theories of life really live? Are they useful men helping to civilize and elevate their less fortunate fellows? Let us see, omitting all institutions which have not actually graduated students from a college course. There are today in the United States 34 institutions giving something above high school training to Negroes and designed especially for this race. Thus, again, in the manning of trade schools and manual training schools, we are thrown back upon the higher training and its source and chief support. There was a time when any age and worn out carpenter could teach in a trade school, but not so today. Indeed, the demand for college bred men by a school like Tuskegee ought to make Mr. Booker T. Washington the firmest friend of higher training. Here he has as helpers of the son of a Negro senator, trained in Greek and the, math and the humanities and graduated at Harvard. The son of a Negro congressman and lawyer, trained in Latin and mathematics and graduated at Oberlin. He has his, and he has a wife, a woman who read Virgil and Homer in the same classroom with me. He has a college chaplain, a classical graduate of Atlanta University as teachers of science, a graduate of Fisk as a teacher of history, a graduate of Smith. Indeed, some 30 of his chief teachers are college graduates. And instead of studying French grammars in the midst of weeds or buying pianos for dirty cabins, they are at Mr. Washington's right hand helping him in a noble work. And yet one of the effects of Mr. Washington's propaganda has been to throw doubt upon the expediency of such training for Negroes as these persons have had. Men of America, the problem is plain before you. Here is a race transplanted through the criminal foolishness of your fathers. Whether you like it or not, the millions are here and here they will remain. If you do not lift them up, they will pull you down. Education and work are the levers to uplift the people. Work alone will not do unless it is inspired by the right ideas and guided by intelligence. Education must not simply teach work. It must, must teach life. The talented tenth of the Negro race must be made leaders of thought and missionaries of culture among their people. No others can do this work and Negro colleges must train men for it. The Negro race, like all other races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. 